I'm Lorna Lake, and this is why I believe in Jeremy Bamber's innocence. My grandmother had books on her shelves with titles such as Poisoners of Women and Murder by Person or Persons Unknown. They were accounts of Victorian and early 20th century crime. It was enough to get me interested in the true crime genre. This was a time when the majority of the public believed that British justice was fair, making only the occasional mistake. It was concern about those mistakes that brought about the abolition of capital punishment in the United Kingdom in 1965. There had been an outcry in 1923 when Edith Thompson was hanged. Her husband was killed by her lover in October 1922. The trial was only a few weeks later in December when it was established that she influenced her lover and even though she did not physically carry out the murder, she was convicted. There had been the infamous John Christie case. Christie was certainly guilty of six gruesome murders. He was tried in June 1953 and hanged in July 1953. But Timothy Evans had already been hanged for the murder. It became clear that John Christie had committed. Timothy Evans was cleared of this crime in 1965 and posthumously pardoned. There were other hideous errors. Mahmoud Matan had been hanged in 1952 and following years of campaigning he was declared innocent in 1998. Derek Bentley was hanged for his part in the shooting of a police officer even though it was known he had learning disabilities and had not handled the gun. His partner in crime who had fired the gun was given a police prison sentence as he was too young to face execution. The public had been greatly disturbed by the Ruth Ellis conviction. She shot her lover, and though there was considerable evidence to demonstrate that she was emotionally unstable at the time, she was also hanged in July 1955. But the repeal of capital punishment has not stopped great injustices being committed. In the last 30 years, there have been now, many now infamous cases. Stephen Dowlin imprisoned wrongly for 28 years. The Birmingham Six, Judith Ward in jail for 18 years. The Guildford Four and Jerry Conlin served 15 years. The Bridgewater Four, 18 years, though one man da died in jail after only two years. Sean Hodgson served 27 years. And Stephen Kisco served 16 years and sadly died a broken man within a year of freedom. The list goes on, and each case represents human tragedy, compounded by an antiquated legal system which has resisted reform and is somehow insulated against scrutiny. Too many convictions have now been fabricated, used fabricated evidence and careless investigation on the part of the police. The public is now able to access information regarding crimes and criminals on the internet. There is a wealth of detail available on dedicated sites, which even include post-mortem results and even photographs of crime scenes. Mainly this is good. It leads to so-called transparencies where we, the great British public, can become fully informed. But there's a downside to all of this. The public is led to believe that all the information is available, and this is simply not true. Some information regarding the Jeremy Bamber case is locked away under the rules of PII, not only from public scrutiny, but even from Jeremy's defence lawyers. In total, 340,000 documents and 259 photographs were withheld. Jeremy has been in prison for 30 years for a crime he could not possibly have committed. There was absolutely no forensic evidence against him. 
all the evidence was circumstantial and witness statements were demonstrably inaccurate. The tragic deaths in White House Farm in August 1985 took Jeremy from a family that he loved as well as his freedom. Scott Lomax wrote the excellent book, Jeremy Bamber, Evil Almost Beyond Belief, which is certainly a very good introduction to the case. The available evidence totally supports Jeremy's innocence, and even now, as more evidence is coming to light, despite Essex Police and the relatives having destroyed items which could have helped at the time of the trial, and even they even fabricated evidence too. There are many people who should truly hang their heads in shame for their part in this travesty. What started as a relatively simple but devastating family tragedy has now turned into one of the gravest miscarriages of justice this country has ever seen. But there's another worrying aspect to this case. In 1985, care in the community was being introduced. The great British public was already concerned at the prospect of mad people being loose in the streets. The last thing the establishment wanted was a family to be wiped out by a poor lady inadequately treated for schizophrenia. There was a great deal of money to be made from the new plans for the mentally ill. There were many psychiatric hospitals on prime building sites and many property developers were rubbing their hands with glee at the prospect of the profits ahead. There have been many terrible incidents where mentally ill women have murdered their children during the last 25 years. Sadly, Sheila was the first. The establishment had many reasons to find Jeremy Bamber guilty. I had initially been nervous about writing Jeremy. Although I had no doubt about his innocence, I was worried that my name and address might end up in the wrong hands. But after a little procrastination, I plucked up the courage and wrote a card and enclosed some stamps. I was astonished when only three days later I received a very friendly letter in reply. This was the start of our regular correspondence. Letters which at first contained news of his case and sincere friendship. I have a lifetime's experience of people and additionally I have trained as a mental health nurse. I have never heard or read anything from Jeremy which has given me a moment's doubt about his innocence. We speak on the phone regularly. That's added a valuable dimension to our friendship, not least because of his sense of humour. Jeremy is never self-absorbed, despite his cruel circumstances, and he always remembers to ask about my dear old rescue dogs. But with little preamble, I've asked Jeremy very direct questions about that night's events. There is never any hesitation in answering nor is there any hint that he resents such inquiry. I've seen it stated that Jeremy is arrogant. He's not. He's very intelligent, very loyal, very kind and very sensitive. And he brings those qualities to very sincere friendships. In short, and as has been said before, Jeremy is a very special yet ordinary man in truly extraordinary and outrageous circumstances. I'm very proud to call him my friend.